All right, well, we are, this is the last message in the message series circles. If you've uh, been around here for a hot minute, um, this whole message series really has been, been about our circles of relationship. And I believe that we're living in a day and age where relationships matter more than ever. Statistically speaking, people are lonelier than ever. They're more depressed than ever. They're more anxious than ever. And I believe in our 21st century, with technology, social media, and our culture, we are growing further and further apart and not closer together. And um, I was actually at a, a retreat for pastors one time, and I remember I was praying for revival. And I was asking God to bring revival, and I was praying for you, I was praying for our church, I was praying for our valley, because I believe that uh, there's a mandate over this valley for revival. And I believe that it's going to be a hot spot for revival one day. But I was praying for revival. I'll never forget this. I felt the Lord said, don't look for revival like it's come in the past. If you do, you might miss it. And I said, wow. I said, Lord, help me. And, and I started praying and asking him, what do I look for? And he said, I want to bring a revival of relationship. And I heard that very phrase, revival of relationship. And it, and it made me kind of pause, took me back. And I was asking the Lord, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? And he said, this, the next revival I'm going to bring is going to happen as my people and my church get awakened to my purpose in their life. And they start building bridges of relationship with people outside the church. And then I, I heard two other phrases this week when I was praying into this message. And I got to admit to you, uh, I'm a little torn this morning because I feel like I've got a message the Lord wants me to preach. And then there's a message that I want to preach. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm torn between the two because it's kind of burning inside me a little bit. Because as I was praying about this message, I heard this phrase, get out of the room. And again, I asked the Lord, what do you mean by that? Get out of the room. And he said, my people want to stay in the room, but I need them to get out of the room. And then he reminded me that before the upper room happened, there was another upper room. And we often think about the one and remember the one upper room and forget about the other. And he said, before I ever poured out my spirit in the upper room, I washed my disciples' feet in an upper room. And he said, what I did on the day of Pentecost was simply to empower people to do what I did when I washed the disciples' feet. And he said, but, but I had this thought, what if the disciples never stepped out of the upper room? What if they just loved God's presence so much, his power so much, they, they decided that, hey, we just want to stay here. We just want more of God. We just want to stay here. And I think as a charismatic church, as your pastor, and, and at, in a time in history when I believe God is pouring out his spirit on his church once again, and people are getting hungry and thirsty for the things of God, and many of you are here, you're not even part of a church. In fact, you came here today with a friend, or you, maybe you're not even sure how you got here, uh, but you're here. And the reason you're here is because I believe that we're living in a day and age where people are tired of fake. They're looking for something real. They're looking for something tangible. They want, to, they want to believe, and inside, we believe, we know it, because God says in his word that he's placed eternity in the hearts of his people. That means whether you believe in God or not, there's something placed inside of you by your creator that says, I am destined for something more. That there's got to be, just like I was a 19-year-old, broken young man, just graduated high school, barely, through summer school, and had no hopes, no dreams, didn't know I was living for the next party, and when there was no party, I'm like, now what? <laughs> I don't know what to do. All my friends are going off to college. They're going into army. And here I am. And I remember coming home from a party one night, two in the morning, laying in my bed, staring at the ceiling. And I said these words, there's got to be something more to life than this. And so I think there's something that God has placed inside of us that knows that there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more, even as good as this is, right? It can't be about all that what God is doing here. And, and as a charismatic church and, and a movement, we could get stuck in a place where we just want more and more of God, and we should want more of God. But you have to understand what the more is for. 
If you miss what the more is for, you're just going to be asking for more and for more and for more. But God is saying, if you would just take what I've already given you and you would pour out what I've given you, I would press down, shake together and pour out a blessing on you that you wouldn't be able to contain. And so there's a spiritual principle that we have to understand. You have to understand what the more is for. The more is for you to pour out. Don't forget the upper room. You got you to remember the first upper room if you're going to understand what the second upper room is all about. And the second upper room was all about pouring in so that we can pour out. And until we understand that, there's something that it, even in church isn't going to ever satisfy. Because God will give us more, but unless we're using the more for his plan and for his purpose then we're just getting more, right? And so God put this message on my heart for the last one in this message series because honestly, for a lot of these messages have been focusing on how we can do relationships better, how we can allow God to do a work in us so that we can work out our relationships better, we can grow closer to other people. But, but this message I say for last because I believe if we don't get this one, and, and I'm just going to go straight to the title. Sorry, I, I know I'm going to mess with you. I know I already am, but thank you. I love you. I do. Can we give it up for the people behind the scenes that have to put up with me? Just get in a mic and spouting off whatever's on my head, around this head. The title of my message is Relationship with a Purpose. Relationships with a Purpose. Because I think one of the things we can become... Um, can we, we, we can find ourselves in danger of is in our consumer-based culture that we could start treating church like we do going to the movies or anything else, and we can start consuming content and start thinking that the more content we, we have and the more we know about God and the more we know about his word and the more we've been taught, the, the more we're qualified someday to actually make an impact for the kingdom of God or in the lives of other people, to actually be used for a purpose beyond ourselves. In fact, um, I studied psychology at a Christian university. I say that because some of you are already judging me. And um, I say it like this, Jesus is the best Christian counselor ever because God created human beings and psychology is the study of human behavior. So who, who better knows you your ins and outs, the way you think, the way your brain was made to work, the way your soul was made to work with your brain and your spirit and all that good stuff. Who else better knows you than Jesus? So I believe the Bible is the best counseling manual ever. Can I get an amen, somebody? But I remember studying about a guy named Abraham, Abram Maslow in, in one of my psychology classes. Abram Maslow created something called the hierarchy of needs. And he started this, it looks like a triangle, and it starts with the most basic needs, like food, shelter, and then it, you know, it goes up each ladder in the pyramid, keeps going up. As you get each need met, you can actually focus on the next need that you have as a human being. And the final need was self-actualization, like you're aware of yourself and uh, you have self-awareness and, and you're, the things that... Uh, you know, you want to do and stuff like that. And that was it. For years, Abram Maslow um, was literally dying. It was near the end of his life. And he had this revelation. I believe it was actually a revelation from God, even though from what I understand, he wasn't necessarily a believer. But he had this revelation and he actually changed his hierarchy of needs. He, he, he got this revelation, and what the revelation was is that our highest need isn't to actually be self-actualized, but it's to be self-transcendent. And what that means is that the highest need, the highest need that you and I have is to transcend ourselves, which, let me translate that for you. It means to live for something greater than yourself. That all of us were born on purpose, for a purpose, and we were destined by God in Christ Jesus 
to not just receive, but to give out what God has planted inside of you. And each of you, um, I love Paul in Ephesians chapter four. He starts out by saying this, and this is what I feel like I'm doing this morning as your pastor. He says, I, a prisoner of the Lord, I, Paul, prisoner of the Lord, I implore you, I beseech you, I'm begging you to live a life worthy of the calling for which you've been called. And I think if we're not careful, we could be in danger of living a life that doesn't really matter. Now hear me when I say that. Because I'm saying that in light of eternity. I'm saying that in in what really matters in life. I don't know at the end of our life, we're going to be laying in our bed and we're going to be thinking about the the six-point bull that we shot. that scored whatever, 350. I don't know, CJ, help me out. I don't know any scores like that. I'm not a a kid from Yonkers, New York. Sorry. But um, we're not going to have picture of the biggest fish we caught, the greatest vacation we went on, the biggest house we built, all our achievements in this life. No, we're going to want to bring me my closest people. I want to say something to them. I want to bless them. I want to be with them. It's, it's, it's the people around us that matter most. And it was the people around Jesus that mattered most. That's why he came. He took on flesh and everywhere he went, he stopped for the one. He understood that he was building relationships on purpose. Now think about Jesus life for a minute. Jesus had these uh, circles of relationship. He had I'll start with the 120. He had 120, roughly, they say, followers that kind of followed him around, but they kind of followed him a little bit at a distance. And then there was the 72. The 72 followed him, but they were a little bit more involved in his, his earthly ministry. And then he had the 12. The 12, that was his core, right? But then even within the 12, he had his three. Peter, James, John. And you see these relational circles that Jesus spent his time and invested in the relationship for a purpose, on purpose. And if we're not careful, we can live life and miss out on the fact that our relationships aren't just for our benefit. They're not just for us to have friends. It's wonderful to have friendships. And yes, there's a part uh, of, of creation, the way that God created us to enjoy each other's company and have relationship. But I also believe that God made us to have relationships with a purpose. That we're supposed to have relationships that where Christ in you rubs off on the Christ in them or or the Christ in you calls up people who don't know Jesus. But we have an answer for the hope that's inside of us, right? There's a scripture that says, be ready. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. And we hear messages like this, and you hear it all the time from the church about living life on purpose. And and what I think happens is we can get overwhelmed. You hear things like, hey, we're going to change the world. And you need to change your world. And like, I'm just trying to change my baby's diaper. I'm trying to like pay my bills, pastor. I agree, I'm going to change my world, right? So here, I, I want to break it down and try to make it simpler for us because I do believe we're supposed to change the world. But here, here it is. To change, your, to change the world, start by changing your world. Amen. Amen. Each of us have these circles of relationships. In fact, um, this would be a good time to read my, my scripture to you that I'm supposed to read. Um, let's do that, and then I'll unpack it a little bit. In Acts chapter 16, let me set the context for you. You know what happened. I talked about in the upper room. I love that God's spirit poured out. The the disciples, they got out of the room. Just like we need to get out of the room. What God does here, we can't keep here. We got to take it. I never wanted to lead. I've always had a passion to lead an Acts church. That's why they call it the Acts of the Apostles. Because we're supposed to do, we're supposed to be called into action. You know, someday we're not going to get to heaven and God's going to say, well done, good and faithful hearer. Well done, good and faithful sayer. No, well done, good and faithful servant. You did something with what I gave you. And so it's the book of the Acts of the Apostles. The church was always meant to be an action church, not a just gather, hear the word, and go home. It was meant to gather, get equipped, get empowered, and then take what God is doing here out into a world that desperately needs what you and I have. Get out of the room. 
And I thought this, this was the other statement that I heard is I had this picture of, of the apostles in that upper room and the spirit of God pouring out on them and they start, you know, tongues of fire and, and I know it's weird, but it's the power of God and they start speaking in other languages and that's weird too until you read the rest of the story which because of Pentecost there were foreigners from all different countries and because God empowered them with a supernatural gift they were speaking in the languages of the people that were around them. You have to understand God's gifted you with a gift for the people that are around you that they need it, but they didn't stay in the upper room. And I had this picture of them coming out of that upper room. And I thought, oh my goodness, here comes the bride. Here comes the bride of Christ. Here comes the church. The church was birthed out of the going out of the room. Jesus said, hey, he said, I want you to go into all the world and make disciples Disciples is when you take somebody else and you give them what God gave you and you help them understand the things of God and you help them grow in the character of God. I want you to go into all the world and I want you to make disciples of all nations. That word nation is the Greek word ethnos. It means people that are not like you, don't look like you, act like you, talk like you, are a different culture than you, color than you. He says, I want you to go to people that are different than you. And I'm afraid the church has gotten together and get stuck in the room with people who are like us. And it's time to get out of the room and to go into our world to people who are not like us, don't think like us, act like us, vote like us. Mm. And make disciples, teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that I've told you. And he says, listen, now wait for it. Wait for it. I want you to wait in the upper room until the power comes. And when the power comes, you're going to be under the power of the Holy Spirit to do what I've asked you to do. You got to wait for that. You got to have that to do what I've called you to do. You can't do either one without it. But now the church is birth. Paul and the apostles, God is adding to their number daily, daily, as they gather together and they go, they gather and they go, gather and go, and they're, and they're praying, and 3,000 are added to their, could you imagine if this was happening to, 3,000 added to the church one day, through one person getting healed, 3,000 added because Paul stood up among them and, and preached the word, and they were astonished, and they said, what must we do to be saved? And then, so now this is all happening. And I love the book of Acts. It, it, it reminds me uh, of who we're called to be as the church. In case you forgot, I want to remind you this morning. I want to stoke the fire inside of you. I want to poke you in the purpose for which God made you. And I want to release you. I want to kick you out of the room. Because I love you and I love what God is doing here. And I, and I want more, just like you. I'm asking for more. I'm crying out for more. I want to see revival happen. But I also want to remind us, because I believe it's coming. I believe it's happening. It's happening. The, it, the ground is beginning to shake. I hear the sound of a rushing wind. I'm starting to feel the cool breeze of the Holy Spirit moving. But I want to prepare us as the church to get ready. Because when the more comes, don't forget what the more is for. And so now Paul understands what the more is for, that God is using him in a powerful way to plant churches and share the gospel and people are coming to faith in Christ. And he's just doing what God has called him to do. And, and I'm up here trying to do what God has called me to do. But you have to understand, live a life worthy of the calling for which you're called. You got a calling. You got a purpose. It's the reason you're alive. It's the reason you're here. Otherwise, when you got saved, God would have just beamed you up, Scotty, and you would have prayed a prayer and you'd be gone and you'd be chilling in heaven with Jesus, right? But we got to get out of this 21st century, I'd say, consumer mindset about the church. We don't just come to church to get us a little Jesus juice, right? I got my little Jesus fix and now I'm good for the rest of the week. No, you're empowered for a purpose. And we're going to read the story in Acts chapter 16, verse 13 through 15. And then we're going to jump down to verse 25. So now Paul, he's, he's about to go to Asia and the Holy Spirit through a dream, he has this dream of a man in Macedonia asking him, begging him to come help. And so Paul recognizes that God, like the plan that he had, that wasn't God's plan and that he's redirecting him to Macedonia. So Paul and Silas, they go to Macedonia and this is their first encounter 
um, in that place. It says this in verse, verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. Now look at this. This is a God setup. You have to un understand something about your life. When you start looking for what God is doing, the things that you plan for, God is going to show you, I got, I got a different plan. And so they think they're going down for prayer, but this is a setup by God. And he says, we met a slave, oh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 13, to City of Riverbank, where we thought people would be meeting for prayer, and we sat down to speak with some of the women who are gathered there. So now there's these women by the riverbank, and they're working, we believe, for this woman named Lydia, who owns a, a linen business. She's, she creates beautiful linen purple royal linen and probably sells for a lot of money and she's probably a very wealthy woman and so all these women are down by the river and they're probably working with their linen and stuff like that and he says so we sat down to speak with some of the women who were gathered there and one of them was a woman named Lydia and I'm not even going to try to say that word I try to say it in first service and it just it didn't come out good um, it's a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God and as she listened to us Listen to this. The Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. And she, and I want you to underline this word, and her household, not just her, her household were baptized and she asked us to be her guests. If you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. Now going down to verse 25. Now, let me show you this. So now the church there in Philippi, this is, this is where the Philipp church, and uh, Paul wrote the book Philippians to this church. This is the original church. This is the first convert in the church in Philippi. And it's this lady who God would now use her business to help fund the church and to grow the church. It's like God needs to use business people. Don't think just because you're in business, God can't use you. God can use you in the kingdom in mighty ways. In fact, I heard a pastor friend of mine told me about a group of businessmen, very wealthy businessmen um, in the Dakotas that would gather together and they had a heart for kingdom, for the kingdom. What can we do? We're very wealthy. We're, we're astute business people. We're made, our companies are making a lot of money. We've made some good investments, but we don't want to keep it for ourselves. Remember what the more is for. We want to use it to build the kingdom. And they started pulling together their money and started using it and giving it to churches and giving it to ministries that they felt were making a kingdom impact. They've given over uh, around a billion dollars to churches and ministries, all because they've been successful business people. And just like this lady, Lydia, she was a successful businesswoman and she would be a cornerstone in the church in Philippi. And, and so now God is moving in that city. People are getting saved and Paul and Silas are going around sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's this woman who's a slave. She's actually in, uh, uh, enslaved by her owners. She's in the slave trade. And she has a gift that God gave her of prophecy. She, she can see things in the spirit world. But yet she's under the compulsion of an evil spirit. So this is something we have to understand. There are people that are very gifted by God, but they're not using their gifting for the kingdom. They're using it for the world. And this lady was going around harassing Paul and Silas, saying, saying look, these people, these men, they, they're proclaiming about the Son of God. And that sounds great. But it gets a little annoying when you have some woman following you around, screaming that the whole time when you're trying to talk. And so this, this goes on for days. Finally, Paul, Paul gets tired of it. You got to love Paul. And he just stops and he says, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Stop. And this evil spirit comes out of her. And now there's a problem because she's not making money telling fortunes anymore for her slave owners. And so they get upset because Paul just killed their business. He killed their business model. So they get a mob together to get Paul and Silas. And they come and they beat them and they put them in prison. And here's where we pick it up in Acts 16, 25. It says this, about midnight, Paul and Silas, Paul, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. And it says that, um, the other prison was listening. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations and all the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. 
Listen, you have to understand something. When God sets you free, it's never just for yourself. There's a ripple effect of using you to help free up the others around you. It's not your chains that just fall off. It's the chains of the people around you. Come on, that's a good word right there. And, um, and it says in verse 27, the jailer woke up, he's freaking out, and he sees the prison doors wide open. He, he thinks, I'm gonna die because I'm responsible for this. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Can I say that to some of you here? Maybe you're here and you're one of those, like you came with a friend, you don't know how you got here, but you're looking for something real. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Along with everyone, look, check this out. Here's that word again. Along with everyone in your what? Your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his what? Household. Even at the hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds Man, we need people to wash wounds. And he brought them, then he and everyone in his household, what? Were immediately baptized, just like we did today. And he brought them into his house and he set a meal before them. And he and his entire, what? Household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Man, what God is doing in your life, it's not just for you. It's for you and your household. And so this is, this, is, this is so key. We've got to get this. I believe that the church needs a reawakening to who it really is. And when it does, the world's going to say, oh my gosh, here comes the bride. Here comes the glorious, beautiful bride of Christ that's so attractive that people like that, that, that jailer are going to run to us and say, what must we do to be saved? And here, here's the thing you, you got to get, and I want you to get this. And, you know, uh, this isn't a popular message because a lot of us, we come to church, we want to be ministered to, and you should be. But remember, you got to understand what the more is for. The more God gives you, the more he's called you to use what he's given. In Ephesians chapter 4, there's three verses that I think I, I want to remind us of. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, it says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. This is commonly known as the five-fold ministry. These are the gifts. Um, actually, in the NLT, it says, these are the gifts that Jesus gave the church, right? He's given gifts. And now here's what the more is for. Verse 12, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. In verse 13, until... We all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, here, here's the problem. Oftentimes, we reverse the order and we start out with verse 13, 11, 12. In other words, we wait to be used by God in the lives of other people. We wait to have relationships with a purpose until we're mature until we all come into the unity of faith, until we, we feel like we know enough. I've been to enough church services. I've been a part of the church for three years now. Pastor, I think I'm ready to be used. Yeah, well, you might have missed your window because I believe the best time to be used by God is when you're on fire because God changed your life and you just got to go tell everybody. Like when God got a hold of my life, I couldn't keep it to myself. I told everybody at work until they told me to shut up or they came to church with me. And, and that's just the way I, it rolled. And I think sometimes we miss our window because we're waiting. What are you waiting for? God has given you everything you need to start where you are. But here's the deal. Just like Jesus had his circles of relationship for a purpose, you have them too. Do you know that word household in the Greek is the word oikos? It literally means household, but it, it doesn't mean household in the way that we would think of household. In, in Jewish culture, household would mean your immediate family, yeah, husband, wife, kids, but it would also mean one to two generations grandparents, aunts, uncles, slaves. 
that you took in were a part of your family, foreigners that came in from other places that you took into your house. It basically, sociologists uh, think of it like this, that each of us have anywhere from five to 12 people in our life that we have influence over, that you are in relationship that is in your circle of influence that you have impact on. And can I tell you something? If you will start using your relationships for a purpose, you watch out. Watch out what God will happen. There's a ripple effect. So the first thing that you have to do to be used by God to have relationships for a purpose is you have to recognize the people around you. Just recognize the people around you. And how many of you have heard the book Circle Maker by Pastor Mark Batterson? Amazing book. What if you started out by just praying for one person, circled them in prayer every day, started praying, God, I pray that you would create an opportunity for me to share. Do you know that the greatest weapon you have? Some of you think, man, I don't have anything. Well, do you have a testimony? That's your story. That is the most powerful thing. What does the Bible say in Revelation? How do we overcome? We overcome by the blood of the lamb, what Jesus Christ did, and by the what? Just like I said today, you got a word inside of you. You got a testimony. You've got a story to tell that God will place people around you. Oh, this is so good. You got to get it. When you start to see that God has strategically placed people around you and in your life for a purpose greater than yourself, and he wants to use you for something greater than yourself, and you start to share your story and your testimony with the people around you, there just might be somebody that says, man, Tell me more about that. Maybe if God did that for you, he could do it for me. And what if you started circling in prayer every day, started praying for those people and praying for an opportunity? Listen, I, I believe God will create holy moments. Do you know there's two words for time in the Bible? One is chronos, which literally means time, like time, like I'm on the clock and I know it. And then there's, um, then there is, oh shoot, I lost it. Kairos, thank you so much. Kairos moments. Those are moments in time. Those are windows of opportunity. I pray that God gives, and I want to ask you to pray for the people around you, that God opens up a moment. And, and you got, but you got to be listening for it and looking for it. If you don't listen for it and look for it, you can miss it. This is one of the things I love about my wife. We'll, we'll be like, I remember years ago, we were in Las Vegas during spring break. Kind of sounds nice right about now, but um, we were there and, <laughs> no, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And uh, we were at, we were going through the aquarium at, I forget, the Mirage or one of those places that have this really sick aquarium. It's really cool. And we were going through the aquarium and we all come out through the aquarium and I'm like, where's my wife? Where'd she go? look around. So I go back in to look for her. And you know what? She is speaking the word of God to this lady who worked there. And the lady's just wiping tears from her eyes. And, and I just, I'm like, I love my wife. <laughs> she didn't miss the moment. She recognized God dropped something in her heart for that person. And she, she didn't miss the moment. You got to recognize that God strategically placed people in your life and the people around you. See, Paul didn't miss his moment. He recognized that God put Lydia on his path. He thought he was going to prayer. And God said, no, I got a person I want you to share me with. And when you're aware of the presence of God, and this is why we've got to be sensitive and pray, God help me to recognize the moments. Because Paul could have missed it, but he didn't. So here's, here's what I want to encourage you with. Who's your one Who's the person that God put in your path? Look for the one. I love Jesus, don't you? Jesus always looked for the one. I'm reminded of a blind Bartimaeus. See, and this is the problem. We could get so consumed with the crowd that we miss the person. Blind Bartimaeus was screaming, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on me. You know what the crowd told him? Shut up, be quiet, you're too loud, you're noisy. Be quiet, we got, we got business to do here. We're, we're going to the church. We got a prayer meeting to get to. I got a Bible study to go to. I got a service to catch. And you could miss the person 
in the middle of doing this. Just like you could come to church and you could be praying with your friends and talking to your friends. Meanwhile, there's somebody that came to church and they're hurting. They're struggling with depression, anxiety, and they just, they just want to know somebody sees them. Somebody cares. And, and let me tell you, I love I, every time uh, I, I talk to somebody that uh, out in public, sometimes there'll be somebody to come up to me and say, hey, are you the pastor of Hope Church? And I say, yes, I am. She said, man, I just want to tell you, like, I came to your church and somebody came up to me and they encouraged me with this word. And I just felt so cared for and loved. And I said, man, that's my church. And I love that I get to be a part of. And I, I say part of because I'm a part of it. Yeah, I'm the lead pastor, but I'm just doing my part. You got a part. You got a purpose in this church. And this is not a church. This church, I, we got to get away from the celebrity pastor thing and that leadership, top heavy leadership, that old model of doing church is not working. How do I know that? Because people are leaving the church, not coming to it. And the church has got to get back to being the bride of Christ. And we got to get back to getting back to the basics, getting back to an ax church who's more concerned about the people around them in their community, in their neighborhood, in their schools, in their workplace. Yes. Right. We got to get back, to church. Because when they do, when we do, look out, here comes the bride. Here comes the bride. So not only is it the people around you that God will place, he also places you. It's the place that you're in. Sometimes we, we think, oh man, I, if I was just in another place, if I was in a better place, if I had a better job, if I had, if I had a better church, if I had a better small group, if I, if I had a better neighborhood, you know, neighbors, then maybe God can use me. But can I share with you a secret? Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Listen to this. You got to get this. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And listen, and he marked out their appointed times, Kairos, in history and the boundaries of their lands. Let me translate that for you. God created you and you were born for such a time as this in the place that you are. You were born in this moment in history, at this place in time, and God marked out your appointed boundaries. That means where you're living. That means your job, your church, your neighborhood. God has put you there strategically, on purpose, for a purpose. And if you miss out recognizing the place that God has put you, you'll miss out on the purpose for which you're there. The third thing is this. You got to recognize that there's a passion. If you're going to do relationships on purpose, for purpose, you got to tap into the passions that God put in you. Now, um, I remember reading a story about a lady named Agnes. Agnes was a teenager. She became a nun. She felt the call of God on her life, and she became a nun at a very young age. And she went to her superiors in the Catholic Church, and she said, I got a passion. I got a passion to start an orphanage in Calcutta, India. So my heart breaks every time I see an orphan and I read God's word that says his, his heart is for the orphans and the widows. She says, I, I just can't get away from it. It's just it's burning inside of me. She says, it's okay. Well, how are you going to start this orphan? She says, I don't know, but I got three pennies and a passion. And they looked at her and said, three pennies. You can't start an orphanage with three pennies. In fact, you can't do anything with three pennies. You know what her response was? With three pennies in God, I can do anything. Here's the problem. Too many of you are looking at what's in your hand and you're saying, I can't do anything with this. But let me tell you something. When you're willing to put what you've got in the hands of God, you can do anything. Moses stood before God at a burning bush. He said, you picked the wrong guy. I can't do what you're asking me to do. You know what God's response was? What's in your hand? Oh, this? This is just the staff. This is the shepherd's staff. I, it's nothing. God said, drop it on the ground. Let go of it. Look what I can do with it when you give it to me. 
and that staff, that ordinary staff turned into a snake. Jesus was speaking to the multitudes and, and the disciples were worried because they'd been hearing Jesus preach for a long time and they were getting hungry. They had a long way to travel. And they said, Jesus, we, how are you supposed to feed all these people? Jesus said, I don't know. You give them something to eat. In other words, what's in your hand? What do you got to give them? Why don't you start with that? And they're like conferring together. Where's the latest? Where's the 7-Eleven? Can I get a, a big bite and a Slurpee? Can, and up walks this little boy with the faith of a child. Come on, now speak to some of you this morning. We need to get back to childlike faith. Just believing God for his word and who he is. And he says, I got a couple of fish and some bread. I know it's not much, but here you go. And he gives them to Jesus and Jesus takes the few and he thanks God, breaks the bread, thanks God. And God blesses it and multiplies it and feeds thousands. Because somebody was willing to step out in faith and use what God gave them. It'd be years later, 1979, Agnes, a.k.a. Mother Teresa, would be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. But it was 50 years. You don't go from a few pennies in a, in a passion to winning the Nobel Peace Prize overnight, but continually trusting God, putting your faith in Him. And there was this uh, group that really wanted to talk to Mother Teresa and, and know her secret. And they, they, they kind of cornered her and said, can we ask you a question? She said, sure. She says, how do we, how do we do it? She's like, do what? How do we do what you did? How do we change the world like you changed the world? And you know what she did? She looked them dead in the eye and she said these four words, find your own Calcutta. Can I tell you something? Find your own Calcutta. You got to find what you're passionate about. And let me tell you something. I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but God gave these two incredibly godly gifted men a dream at the same time, Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham. And they were both on vacation in Colorado and God gave them a dream the night before they were going to have lunch together the next day. And they get together the next day and they share each other, the dream with each other. And, and, and they're, to, to their amazement, God gave them the exact same dream. And you know what the dream was? They saw seven mountains, and each of the mountains represented a place in society, government, healthcare, uh, arts and entertainment, sports, um, education, all these different areas, seven mountains of society. And they talked and they prayed together and decided, we, we need to help the church, and we need to help Christians all over the world go into these seven mountains. Go, get involved, take your passion. Some of you, they, they, I've heard it like this, what makes you sad, mad, or glad? That's how you know what you're passionate about. Something that just makes you mad when you hear about injustice, it makes you mad. When you hear about corruption in government, it makes you mad. When you hear about something in education, it makes you mad. When something goes right, it makes you happy. It makes you glad. Listen, there's some of you in the room, you're passionate about politics. Use it for a purpose. Go get it, get involved in the school board, run for office, run for local office. Give God what you got. Take a first step in faith and watch what he can do. Some of you are passionate about entertainment or sports or arts. Listen, we can't give these things up to the world. This is the problem that the church has stopped invading the seven mountains. And if we would get back to being the church to go, get out of the room, use your passion, look for the people around you, recognize the place that God has put you in and the last thing and I'm done. That is, you gotta lean into your pain. Because God will use your pain. Paul and Silas, look, you know what blows me away about this story? They're in pain. This, we read this whole, what, is, what a cool story. They praise God in the prison door. Listen, they were in serious pain. We dumb down scripture sometimes, but let me tell you, they were in a dark dungeon, cold, probably lying in feces. They, they were starving to death. They were malnourished. They were, they were thirsty, dying of dehydration, probably weak, tired, exhausted. They were beaten with rods and whipped. And they're lying in prison 
in the middle of their pain, they start praising God. And it says that the people around them were listening. Can I tell you, we can't just talk about this stuff and yes and amen it. We've actually got to live it out. <laughs> News alert. We got to live it out. Paul and Silas in the middle of their pain, they were praising God. And not, do you know one of the greatest witnesses to the world is when they watch you go through pain. And so you don't have to hide it. You don't have to cover it up. This is part of being real. When the church starts being real about, hey, I'm struggling in my marriage. I've got pain in my marriage. I've got pain as a parent. I'm, I'm, I'm trying and my, my kid's on drugs and I don't know what to do, but I'm trusting God. I'm praising him in the middle of my pain. I've got health issues. I can't overcome them. But God, I know you're greater and I'm willing to praise you in the middle of my pain. And the world is watching because they want to see what you do outside of here. It's easy to praise God in here, but you'll get the world's attention when you start praising God in your pain. I just want to invite the Holy Spirit to come. I, I believe God is stirring something in our hearts and I don't want to miss the moment. But some of us have been stuck too long. At the end of our life someday, there's, there's going to be an engravement on a tombstone. But I think the greatest tragedy is some of us that aren't really living today. One of my greatest fears when I was praying about to become lead pastor of the church is God, I don't want to miss my moment. I don't want to miss what you called me to and whatever it takes, whatever it looks like. And I know it won't be easy, but I surrender to you. I believe God is calling some of you this morning, even, even in our time of worship, just that, those words. You have to understand the power that your life has the effect on the people around you. I'm gonna share, I'm gonna, Holy Spirit prompted me, so I'm gonna share this and we'll end with this. My mother-in-law wrote a book uh, called The Blueprints of Heaven. There's a chapter in that book called The Ripple Effect. And she starts by giving the history of amazing men of faith, S Smith Wigglesworth, amazing man of faith. God used him in powerful ways for healing and miracles. And there was a, a businessman named John G. Lake who got impacted by the ministry of Smith Wigglesworth. And it changed his life forever. God birthed a ministry through John G. Lake and John G. Lake started being used by God in some miraculous ways in the United States. But there was a moment where God called him to take the ministry, he gave him to South Africa. And he didn't understand why at the time, but he started planting churches in South Africa and he was holding a service one time in South Africa. And this young man who was broken and filled with grief because he lost his brother, his brother had died. And he didn't know what to do and he stumbled into the service and he, and he went up for prayer and God touched him in a miraculous way, powerful way, surrendered his life to Jesus. A man's name was Rodney Howard Brown. Then Rodney Howard Brown, God would call him to be an evangelist or missionary to the United States. And he came over to the United States and he, and he started doing crusades all across the United States. And he was holding a crusade one night and, and this man named Randy Clark came up for prayer. He was a pastor who was hungry for more of God, wanted to see God move powerfully through his ministry, didn't want to waste his life, wanted to be used for his purpose. He came up for prayer. Rodney Howard Brown prayed for him several times. The power of God came on Randy Clark. It would be weeks later, weeks, that that same Randy Clark had an invitation to preach at a few revival nights at Airport Fellowship Church in Toronto. And in those services, which started out with a couple of hundred people, God's spirit poured out. And those couple of nights lasted a couple of months. 
And God started moving in some powerful ways and, and touching people's lives. In fact, many people believe there was hundreds of thousands of people that lives got changed and impacted in churches and ministries birthed all over the world. Even right now, part of this church was impacted because of that revival. But you wanna hear the coolest part for me personally? That 19 year old boy cried out in his bed, it's, there's gotta be more to life than this. Would get invited by his aunt to come to a church service one night in upstate New York. I had no idea that day what would happen, but I went to that service That service was led by Rodney Howard Brown. And he would give an altar call and I would walk up to the front and surrender my life to God. And it would never be the same. <laughs> because of one person that touched the life of somebody else. That touched the life of somebody else that touched the life of somebody else. That touched the life of somebody else. Could you imagine? These walls couldn't contain all the people if each of you would look for the one. Just the one. You don't gotta change the world. You just gotta change your world and impact the people around you in the place that you're in with the passion that God has given you and the pain that you've gone through. Paul understood something about pain. Some of you understand something about pain. So I just want to invite you to just close your eyes right now. I just, I just want to pray for you. Holy Spirit, I just invite you to touch the hearts of your people. God, that you would grip us, that we would not be able to leave without a burden for the people that you've placed around us, for the city you've placed us in, for this valley that our hearts would burn like your heart burns for people that don't know you, that need to know you. They're lost, they're dying, they're hopeless, struggling, addicted, depressed, anxious, fearful. We're looking for hope and we have the answer. 